today's topic, um, I'm giving two talks today. Uh, in the afternoon, is more uh, focus. Uh, this one is more general thoughts. So I hope you understand. Uh, so I talk about how historically, how geometric and uh, geometry and physics interact. Uh, I found a quotation by Beltram Russell saying how mathematics uh, looks like. Uh, it says that possess not only truth, but supreme beauty, coal and ester, like that of a couch, uh, sculpture. And uh, without appeal to any part of our weaker nature, without the gorgeous trapping of painting or music, yet sublimely pure. <clears throat> so this is really a interesting statement because it's perfect almost like, uh, especially geometry. And this is thing that I always feel uh, strong about geometry. And this will be able to be found in uh, many subjects in physics, uh, which I'd like to explain. Um, just about a, a, a month ago, a couple of months ago now, uh, there was an announcement by Caltech and MIT a group that they have found gravitational wave that was predicted by Einstein about 100 years ago, 1916. Einstein predicted the gravitational wave would exist. So this was uh, kind of indirectly uh, predict, uh, not predicted, uh, has been found indirectly when neutron star was found, pulsars was found and all that. But this time is supposed to be direct observation. And this is a very important effect uh, because one can feel the effect of curvature of space time directly. Uh, that's how the gravitational wave gives. And, uh, well, uh, in the whole 20th century, the interaction between geometry and physics is all more or less started by Einstein, the discovery of. Uh, Einstein equation and later on quantum mechanics. So these two major pillars of uh, physics in 20th century has close interaction with geometry, which I should explain now. So um, before Einstein, uh, scientists follow the viewpoint of Newton that space is static and gravity allows action at a distance simultaneously. So when the sun is uh, there and the earth is uh, moving around, directly uh, getting the action from the sun uh, instantaneously, faster than the light speed. And of course, this violates special relativity. This cannot happen. So that's why Einstein has to look for a way to change it. Uh, that's why um, um, Einstein has to find uh, general relativity. So this uh, principle action at distance used by Newtonian gravity is not compatible with the newly found special relativity, which was uh, considered to be fine and good, and therefore something is inconsistent and has to be uh, uh, changed. So uh, already in uh, 1905, when special relativity is found, and um, of course their contribution by Poincaré and many other people, uh, they know that space and time uh, are really mixed up. Because when uh, time, uh, when the speed is very fast, uh, velocity, uh, mass and everything is different. And uh, so there's something uh, that they know uh, space and time are mixed together. But they still thinking, they are still thinking that space is basically three dimension, and we just look at the space and see how time changes. But it's all not until 1908 that the teacher of Einstein, Minkowski, the great mathematician Minkowski, proposed the concept of Minkowski's four dimension space time. Where now a metric of Riemannian type, Lorentzian metric, but it is used to describe all phenomena that appear in special relativity. 
Uh, this metric is very simple, minus uh, dt squared minus summation dx squared. And this is a beautiful description of uh, special relativity based on geometry alone. Uh, the Lorentzian uh, metric, the uh, geodesics, and all kind of uh, uh, interesting symmetry, namely the, the main symmetry is a Lorentzian group, which was used to dictate special relativity. <coughs> and this is a spectacular achievement, uh, which I did not realize when I was a student. Uh, because I learned geometry first, and then I looked at this, I said it is a trivial observation. And, <laughs> and it's a flat space time, nothing challenging about it. But actually, this is a, one of the very major conceptual breakthrough that space time should be four dimensions instead of three. And this is really the first time that we understand space and time are put together in the most coherent manner, a natural manner. And more than that, Einstein, at this year, 1908, realized a very important fact, namely gravity is supposed to be described by a tensor, uh, by the metric tensor, not by a scalar. Uh, this is a, a really major breakthrough because, um, first of all, you know, it should be a four-dimensional object instead of three-dimensional. And, 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 and he knows by thought experiment, after realizing Minkowski's uh, uh, description, uh, experiment is that if you take the quantity to describe gravity, it has a dependent direction at each point. Why? Because uh, general relativity has to be consistent with special relativity when, when, in a small. And when an observer is moving in some direction, the distance he or she measures will change depending on the direction he's measuring. And when it's measured in the direction perpendicular to his movement, nothing changes because velocity is the same um, in the observer in perpendicular to the, to the movement. But it is different when it's parallel to his movement because now he's moving in, in, the, in the speed of light, possibly, and things are drastically changed. So therefore, the way that we measure uh, uh, physics depends on dilations, not just on, on a point. Now, in Newtonian mechanics, it's a scalar function uh, for description of uh, gravity. But here is a tensor, because it now depends on dilations. And that's exactly what uh, tensor was good for. And it was only introduced not long ago, during 1908, uh, before, about 10 years or 20 years before that, Christopher and, uh, introduced tensor and uh, differentiation and all that. So this is very important. And uh, of course, uh, Christopher was inspired by Riemann. Uh, Riemannian tensor was already uh, introduced by Riemann in 1855. Uh, uh, was already uh, used by him for various purposes. And this was a great breakthrough as Newtonian gravity which was measured by scalar function is now by a tensor. And this, I think, is a major conceptual breakthrough for Einstein. Uh, in, instead, uh, most popular writings, including in the last two years, were saying that Einstein had a breakthrough in 1908 because of uh, uh, when it's free for, uh, it doesn't feel anything. Uh, but I think this is more important than that. Namely, he realized that and gravity has to be measured by a tensor, not by a scalar function. Only after that you can make uh, movement on, on the subject. And this was um, a big contribution was given by Grossman, because Einstein actually doesn't know what tensor is at all. He doesn't know enough mathematics. And uh, Grossman was his very close friend, a um, friend in college, and they studied geometry together, although Einstein actually quick classes all the time, so he doesn't know what's going on. It was Grossman who helped him out, uh, actually helped him to do the exercise, <laughs> homework. And uh, anyway, so he got Grossman to tell him what a tensor means. And so he immediately realized that tensor has to be the basic object for gravity, description of gravity. And uh, so 
Now, remember how Einstein's equation is uh, uh, supposed to be. It is supposed to describe gravity. And the major description of gravity was given by Newton before Einstein. And so, no matter how fancy you are, you have to reduce to Newtonian mechanics when the light speed is uh, infinite uh, or, or, or velocity is small compared to light speed. So, uh, no matter what, it has to reduce to that. So, some trace of Newtonian mechanics has to be there. Uh, display, uh, it has to be changed. Uh, so, now, you remember what is Newtonian mechanics. So, you get the potential. The Laplace and what this potential is minus of the matter density. That's a Newtonian mechanical description of uh, gravity. Laplacian of the Newtonian potential, the scalar function, is equal to the uh, um, metric and uh, the matter tensor. So therefore, you have to now the metric tensor is supposed to replace uh, the Newtonian potential. Metric tensor is now unknown, so the metric tensor has the uh, uh, it has the function of being a unknown uh, describing gravity. So you need to differentiate it two times, because Laplace is differentiated in two times. Laplace acting on the Newtonian potential, you differentiate two times. So you have to differentiate metric tensor two times. Uh, so now he wants to make sure everything obeys the equivalence principle, because that's the main the very major principle of general relativity. Uh, everything has to obey equivalence principle. It says that every law of physics is the same, independent of the frame of observer. So no matter how you measure uh, uh, things, using different way of measuring it, the outcome should be the same. And what does that mean? That means when you do the second differentiation of the metric tensor, it has to be tensor again. Because only a tensor could be invariant under change of coordinate system. And change of coordinate system means a change of the way that you observe uh, the, the, the outcome. Okay? You use coordinate system you say in a laboratory, use different frames uh, to measure things. So when you change the frame, you, the outcome should be the same. And this means it should be a tensor. So the second derivative of the of the metric tensor has to be independent of the choice of coordinate system, and therefore has to be tensor. Now then, we did not much things that are known to obtain by differentiating the metric tensor that comes out to be a tensor. Again, after you differentiate twice. And the only thing that could occur is the curvature tensor of the metric. So you differentiate twice, it should be a tensor, and that has to be a uh, curvature tensor on the metric. And the curvature tensor is the only tensor that depends linearly on the second differentiation of the metric, the principal term. Okay? So you try to find a tensor that compute by the second differentiation on the metric, and it should be linear on the highest order term. There's the only one, namely the curvature tensor. So therefore, one conclude when you replace the equation by Newtonian mechanics, where Laplace of the potential equal to minus of the matter density, the left-hand side has to be a curvature tensor. Okay? And the right-hand side, which, has to be, which was the matter density before, now has to be matter stress tensor. That was more, more or less well understood, matter than tensor. So now you try to equate them. So the simple generation of Newtonian equation try to equate the curvature tensor to the matter tensor. Okay? Now curvature tensor actually is a big tensor, it's a rank four tensor. So you cannot equate the whole curvature tensor. There's only one tensor which is uh, 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 rank two tensor, which allows you to equate with the matter tensor. Uh, the matter tensor is symmetric, so the only symmetric tensor which you can use is the something called Ricci tensor. The Ricci tensor is a trace of curvature tensor in some form. And this is found by Ricci not long, that long ago before Einstein, it's about 10 years before him. 
and uh, and this actually was found by Grossman. Uh, and uh, Einstein does not know geometry, um, does not know much about geometry. So Einstein actually, after knowing that the description of gravity has to be Lorentz symmetric tensor, she insists Grossman to look for more uh, uh, literature on in geometry for him. Actually, Grossman was very reluctant to do it, and finally he was forced by Einstein to do so, and he found a Ricci tensor. So, so Ricci tensor was good, and now therefore, you know, on the left hand side of the Einstein equation has to be Ricci tensor, the right hand side has to be uh, um, meta tensor. Now, of course, uh, this was what they did uh, in. Uh, uh, 1912 and 1913. They wrote two papers together. And uh, basically, you write down the equation of gravity in tensorial form. The left hand side is, uh, is the uh, Ricci tensor, and the right hand side is the meta tensor. And this was very nice, beautiful, because it's all tensorial and all that. But he tried to use this resulting equation to explain the periodic theorem of Mercury which was an old, old problem in astronomy, that there was inconsistency uh, 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 of the, mer the movement of mercury uh, under Newtonian mechanics. The inconsistency was very, very small, but still they were interested in understanding that. So he could not explain it, and therefore this equation of gravity cannot be true, and, uh, because he cannot observe the, um, the reality. So, so he was uh, very tempted to give up this equation, and the only way to give up the, this equation at that point was to think that you drop the equivalence principle uh, and use a suitable coordinate system to measure gravity. And this was bad, actually. Uh, and this is bad because then equivalence principle, which is a very important principle, uh, um, is a principle based on symmetry. The group of symmetry is a group of diffeomorphism. This has been one of the most important uh, uh, fundamental principles since the old days, Galileo and all these people has been promoting them. And this has uh, been uh, observed to be, to be true. And so therefore, uh, it would be ridiculous to give them up. Uh, and also it's beautiful. So this is an elegant uh, principle was uh, given up by Einstein several times uh, to try to explain nature. So it's, uh, in a way, it's very funny. It's a conflict between beauty and nature at that point, because nature uh, cannot be described by this equation, and yet the equation was beautiful. But then you look at the equation more carefully, you find out this einstein grossman equation, equating Richard Kircher to um, to the meta tensor does not satisfy the conservation law. Uh, when you write the metric, the meta tensor to be the rigid tensor alone, it does not satisfy conservation law. And conservation law, of course, is important and has been used by in Newtonian mechanics for for, for centuries, and so should not be violated. And they did not realize it at that point, and so. This has to wait until he met Hubert in 1915. Actually, he consulted many geometers uh, in 1913, 1914, 1915. If you look at his correspondence, he already talked with uh, geometers like Levi Civita and all that. And, uh, but then uh, he met Hubert, and in 1915, in the, uh, I think in the spring of 1915, and Hubert actually, um, was working on it in the summer, and they arrived at this equation around the same time on the Einstein equation, which is now called Einstein equation. And Hubert actually found that someone called Hubert Axon, whose variation equation or variation will give the Einstein equation. Now, it's kind of interesting that most historians did not realize that actually Eminotta was in Göttingen at the time. And when Hubert wrote his paper, he even mentioned that Eminotta has contributed 
to this paper he wrote as much as he himself did. So uh, he actually gave a big compliment to Aminata's contribution. So notice that in 1915, uh, Aminata is actually is developing her theory of conservation law uh, using action principle. And the paper, although the paper was published in 1918, but she was developing already. And I'm sure that Hubert actually got influenced by her by developing the action. Hubert action is very simple. It's integral or scalar curvature in the space of metric. So integral or scalar curvature in the space of X, space of all Lorentz metric, give rise to the Hubert action. And you do a second ver first variation of the action, it will give rise to the Einstein equation. Now there was uh, no debate that Hubert was the first one who found the action because Einstein has never thought about action principle in the, in the whole uh, uh, course, uh, 10 years of his trying to understand gravity. But uh, so uh, Hubert found this action principle and from the action principle to, to derive the equation is a trivial matter, uh, any people and, uh, could have done it, uh, who knows where calculus variation. And the physicists actually uh, gave a very ridiculous accusation saying that the calculation takes forever. It uh, takes five days or whatever. Maybe they take, it takes them five days, but certainly it takes Hubert no time to do it. Hubert is an expert on invariant theory. So anyway, so once you know uh, uh, all these things are tensors and invariant under coordinate transformation, the calculation is a standard calculation, and nowadays we can give it to a uh, graduate school to do in the, in the, in the qualified exam. Um, so, uh, so finally, you accomplish a very important uh, equation, Einstein equation. So instead of which tensor on the left-hand side only, you have to modify it to make it to uh, be set by conservation law. So it's very simple. It's just take, uh, minus r over 2 times tij. So uh, you take the trace of the rigid tensor and you make sure the left hand side sets by conservation law. And the fact it set by conservation law was actually known to uh, old days due to uh, rigid and, uh, and Bianchi. Uh, so uh, this whole set of uh, uh, equations um, come out very naturally. Uh, so actually, uh, these, all, these geometers all has great impact on the subject of general relativity because it takes a long time to accumulate together to develop this whole theory. And conversely, the creation of general relativity has tremendous impact on the development of many geometry in the 20th century up to now. Uh, so the impact on general relativity was due to all these older classical uh, mathematicians, ancient mathematicians, but uh, the converse uh, uh, contribution by Einstein and, uh, and uh, later the physicists have been tremendously important up to nowadays. I think without general relativity, the Manning geometry would, could, could have been very much different. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, for one thing, uh, we found a language that we can express high dimensional geometry in a very concrete and nice manner. Before that, the remaining geometry in high dimensions is just a matter of fun. Uh, but here we found some very concrete, realistic uh, description of nature by geometry. So that makes life very different. At least uh, it is very inspired to do that now. So the physicists always claim that Einstein was the first one to use symmetry to derive, derive an equation of interest. And of course, uh, it's true that it started out around there to make much more impact. But at, at actually, uh, I just described to you, the first person who did this was Minkowski. He used the Lorentzian group. He knows Lorentzian group is the key uh, for uh, special relativity. And then he derived this tensor, uh, the Minkowski uh, tensor, by using Lorentzian group as a group of symmetry. So this is the very first one. And then, of course, immediately, uh, when the actual description of uh, uh, contribution to Einstein equation, Emmy uh, Notter has already a very important contribution to it.
But of course, this whole theory was already developed by a geometrist starting from uh, uh, Lee, Sophia Lee, Sophie, uh, and, uh, and, and also Cry. Uh, they have created invariance of geometry by continuous symmetries already in 19th century. And, and in fact, the very famous uh, Arangan uh, program due to Cry was done in, 19, in 1872. And he described, uh, he, he declared that geometry should be classified according to their group of symmetries. And this actually has a deep influence in the development of geometry. Uh, we start to understand the concept of conformal geometry, the concept of affine geometry, the concept of projective geometry from this point of view. And in fact, Catan, uh, Eric Catan and many other uh, geometers uh, make use of this point of view to start the moving frame calculation. And then you can get invariance of uh, geometry based on this concept of Lie groups and uh, infinitesimal calculation. So I think it's a very fundamental role that, pri that, that are played by symmetry in understand geometry. So this was already start in the 19th century, way before physicists looked into that. Uh, the classification of structure Lie group, of course, has been one of the most important chapters in mathematics. Uh, it starts from Lee, as I mentioned, and the Keeling, who is a very fundamental cry, and then continue into 20th century by Eli Catan and Herman Y. Uh, these are really fundamental breakthroughs in uh, mathematics. The classification of Lee group, uh, compact Lee group, and the power and the power of transition theory of finite and compact group has really appeared in both geometry and physics. So we, we, without it's impossible uh, to not to mention this as the the interaction of uh, physics and geometry without notice the importance of symmetry. Uh, so for compact Lie group, of course, uh, this has been important, uh, not just for uh, geometry, but also in quantum mechanics. And Herman Y and Eugene Wigner and others apply this theory to quantum mechanics and has made a very fruitful results in, in the subject of quantum mechanics. And nowadays, up to now, most physicists, uh, particle physicists, the first thing they will look into are the symmetry group. And the group uh, at the beginning was U1 uh, for the electric uh, magnetism, and then the SU2 and SU3, so weak interaction, strong interaction, and grand unification, SU5. All these are related to certain groups. So the representation of these groups has been playing the most important role in classifying the, the particles uh, that appear in nature. So this is really an uh, important uh, process uh, in the whole last century on understanding physics. Uh, in fact, many people have ignored the importance of Emily Norton on the action principle. That has direct influence on uh, modern physics and geometry. So this is really very important. The Norton freedom which was published in 1918 inspired the modern development of mechanics. And uh, the so-called Sympathetic geometry, uh, the, X, the, the moment map and all this has already appeared in the basic concept already appeared in Norton's paper. So many modern concepts that we have been looking at actually dates back to the early days by Norton. So this is a very important uh, thing. And uh, well, at that point, uh, when Einstein succeeded in 1915, uh, there was a great desire to unify all the known forces by using ideas similar to general relativity. So general relativity is a beautiful uh, theory. It put uh, gravity with matter together, but in not in the most natural manner. Uh, Einstein always complained the right-hand side of his equation is not the best. So the left-hand side is kind of made of gold that cannot be changed at all. And, and this is the classical re relativity. But there, a very important concept is electricity and magnetism, which has um, been studied extensively in the 19th century. In fact, by Gauss and, uh, and, um, and Riemann. 
And then later uh, by Freddy and also uh, Maxwell, of course, Maxwell finally finished the whole subject and it's called the Maxwell equation. But Riemann actually has studied these equations uh, quite extensively uh, before Maxwell, actually. Anyway, uh, so one wants to give a unification uh, with uh, uh, electricity and magnetism and, uh, and um, gravity. So there are many approaches and many attempts by Einstein himself, by several mathematicians, including Eli Katan, Herman Wey, and many, many of them. A very important work, uh, two very important work stands out. One is the gauge theory of Herman Wey, and the other one is the Kulisic Klein model of general relativity in five dimensions. So these two developments actually lay the foundation of modern geometry and modern physics. Uh, although it start out just to try to understand uh, uh, gravity, uh, unifying with other subjects, but these two stands out to be most important. Uh, so in the field of electromagnetism, uh, there was the combined electric and magnetic field, which is also attributed to Riemann. This is the compass better of the form, the electricity plus uh, C square root minus one of B. So this is a nice thing to put it together. Electricity and magnetism uh, uh, put together. This is the vector, it's an interesting vector. Because now you can see by putting this way, E and B are in the equal footing. And this is, has become an important concept of duality. They appear in the framework of string field and quantum field fields, up to now. Uh, so, for example, the interpretation of geometric lang lang uh, language program in the world of Kofistin and Witten, originally from a generalization of this electric wave duality to non-abelian context. So the Maxwell equation was considered to be a abelian version of electric magnetism, but you can generalize it to non-abelian context. And in the level of particles, there's a duality between electron and magnetic monopole, which gave birth to the cyber written theory in physics. So this duality between electron and monopole, and all that becomes an important uh, contribution and uh, give rise to cyber written theory, which of course is very important in physics, but as important uh, in uh, geometry, where we see cyber written equation that has changed our understanding of four dimensional manifold quite uh, uh, strongly. Uh, now, Herman White was the first one who introduced this concept of gauge theory. And in fact, this terminology was coined by him. So, gravity can be considered as a gauge theory, which gauge group given by the group of diffeomorphism. Uh, so, the whole group of diffeomorphism acts on uh, gravity, and Einstein was looking at a more special uh, gauge group. Uh, so, he showed that the gauge group uh, is. Uh, is S1, is U1, in the case of Maxwell equation. So Maxwell equation was considered to be a gauge theory with gauge group given by U1. This is rather a very spectacular uh, uh, development uh, when, I, when Herman White was proposing it. So at the beginning, he was looking on some kind of gauge theory, but the group that he used was non-compact, SL2R. Uh, and this cannot preserve link. And this was criticized by Einstein at the time, uh, in 1918. Um, because um, this is a beautiful theory, and Einstein actually likes it. That's why he cared about to criticize it. But the only problem at that time was that after you move around by parallel transportation, the length of the vector would be changed. And this cannot happen in physics. The length should not be changed. But the phase changes is OK. And only after about 10 years, uh, having I learned from the works of London and all that in quantum mechanics, uh, um, that the group should be U1. It should be phase change, not length change. And so the gauge group would be U1 because U1 is just phase. And this, of course, is extremely important. EI theta comes in quantum mechanics and is very compatible with what having wise. Uh, gauge theory. And this, once this group is chosen right, length is preserved because U1 preserves length under parallel transportation. 
and Maxwell equation becomes a gauge theory. And this is really a, one of the most spectacular uh, achievement that an old equation like Maxwell equation, you don't quite see as a gauge theory in the, order, in, in the sense that we are talking now, it finally becomes a gauge theory, a U1 bundle theory. And this was a major achievement because uh, um, this was done in 1928. And then at the time, the theory of connection was developed by many geometers, in fact. And in fact, in 1917 already, Levi in, uh, in order to respond to, uh, uh, to the development of uh, Einstein equation, he started to develop the concept of parallel transport vectors in the many geometry. And why? In, his, uh, in the sense that Levi Chivita's connection was used already by Einstein, but he tried to drop the concept of uh, torsion free. He wanted to allow torsion. And in fact, uh, they, uh, Herman Y also introduced our five connections, and Katan in 1926 studied holonomic group for this general connection. So given a connection, you can do a parallel transportation, and the parallel transportation give rise to a group. This group is called the holonomic group and studied by Katan. Um, so in fact, Levi Chivita and Katan were interested in another approach to extend Einstein theory of general relativity by looking into connections with non-trivial torsion. Uh, so this connection still preserves metric, and this in fact a form of gauge theory on the tangent bundle. So you look at the space of all connections preserving the metric. So the, the, the gauge group now could be SON, and you are allowing the connection to play more important role than the metric. And this is a gauge form of gauge theory. But Hammerman's problem was somewhat different. He does not restrict himself to tangent bundle. He's more interested in general bundle, which describes particle uh, more effectively. And of course, uh, Hermitian connection was then introduced in 1944. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, this was introduced, first introduced in Trent's paper. I'm not sure there are uh, previous uh, 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 people introduced yet. Um, anyway, Chen used uh, the Hermitian connection, and there's sometimes people call it Chen connection, and use it to describe uh, Chen classes. So using the character of the Hermitian connection, he introduced Chen classes of these bundles. And this gives rise to the Durham class of the space of the, of the bundle, which turns out to be integral classes. So these are cohomology classes, which has integer coefficient. So namely, you integrate this class over cycles, integral cycles, the outcome is integer. So this is a very remarkable fact. It generates a concept of Euler class. Euler class is an integer, always. And this is a very remarkable fact. In fact, it's interesting uh, uh, to know that Andre Wei, in his Fubaki uh, talk, he interpret trans theory in terms of invariant theory, and it's now called trend wave theory. And in fact, at that cut point, we said that uh, train classes may be used to quantize physical theory. The fact it becomes integer would be an important approach to quantize uh, 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 physical theory. And this rather foresight, because this was done in 1940s. And by now, of course, in almost everything that we see in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, we use train classes uh, for quantization. It appears in condensed matter, it appears in uh, string theory, it appears in most theory that we know of. And uh, now, the modern formalism connection was in object bundle was introduced by Erisman in 1950. But all, although this concept was already more or less uh, there, but I think formally was introduced by Erisman. And this uh, modern development of high energy physics and theory of condensed matter shows that the prediction of rate is true, as I said. Uh, not only train class play an important role in modern quantum field theory, the secondary class, which is called train Simons invariant, is coming from train class. It becomes an important uh, thing uh, derived from character representative train classes. It plays a very important role in condensed matter physics and string theory, which in turn influences the study of knot field in geometry, 
as was shown by Witten, that can be used to explain the Jones polynomial or the not. So this uh, uh, first time about uh, 30 years ago that Ed Witten interpret the trend Simons invariant uh, to be an action to describe Jones polynomial of the knots. So from this, so at the beginning, it's just a matter of uh, interpreting the Jones polynomial using trend Simons. But then later on, this gives you an important insight into geometry itself. And so that's how you see it's wrong about where you go to quantum field theory and then come back to calculate the volume of a complete hyperbolic metric on a not complement. So, so Witten already know that the trend Simons invariant could be part of an action to give rise to the Jones polynomial, which is one of the important uh, not polynomial appears in the 1980s. And this is a, a, a interpretation given by Witten in quantum field theory. And now you go back well to understand the not complement. According to um, Thurston, uh, the not complement, most cases, admit a complete hyperbolic metric, which is a completely canonical metric, depending only on topology. And they are finite volume. And this volume is an invariant of the uh, not. So any not, if they are equivalent to each other topologically, the complement has the same volume because the hyperbolic metric are equivalent to each other, isometric to each other. So the volume is an important invariant. But actually, more than the volume, uh, besides volume, there's also the trend Simons invariant of the complement, uh, de depending on the, on the metric also. So there's a complex number associated to a knot. The volume, which you can look at as a, uh, the norm. And then there's trend Simons in, in Wayland, and you can look at a phase. So the complex number defined by volume and trend Simons in Wayland is a very natural number, complex number, associated to a knot based on the complete hyperbolic metric. So this was a very important concept. Actually, first himself was looking at this uh, question for quite a while to try to see how to understand not complement uh, through the hyperbolic metric, through the volume and the trend Simons invariant. So that's a volume conjecture due to several mathematicians. And the volume conjecture states that in a certain limit, when number of coloring n approaches infinity in the n color Jung's polynomial, which I won't go into detail. The value of this current not Jung's polynomial evaluate at the nth root of unity is exponential of n times the simplicity volume of the not complement divided by two pi. And this not complement can be uniquely decomposed into hyperbolic pieces and cipher fibrous pieces according to Freston. The simplicity volume is simply the sum of the hyperbolic volume of the hyperbolic pieces of this decomposition. So given a not, a not complement, you can associate a simplicity volume on the not complement. So this conjecture is an important conjecture. It dictates the convergence of the quantum transcendence path integral with non-compact gauge group and has non-trivial connection with three dimensional quantum gravity. So one of the reasons they are interested in this is because of quantum gravity. Uh, this was anticipated by Witten and later studied by Gugov and Wafa. So this whole theory has been developed uh, rigorously even now. Uh, now, so there were two independent developments related to uh, gauge theory. One was the work of Yang and Mills in 1954, in a famous work, who looked at the action on the space of connection on high rank bundles over a metaphor. Uh, so, of course, they were mostly interested in four dimensional manifold, in fact, the four dimensional sphere. Uh, uh, this group of parallel transportation will preserve a high dimensional Lie group whose dimension is in general bigger than the circle group. Uh, the circle group was used by Herman Y to study Maxwell equation. But now, Yang and Mills want to study high dimensional group because they are interested in. Uh, Hypermultiple uh, uh, behavior, more than one particle, 
And this group in general cannot be commutative. High dimensionality groups are in general not commutative. The most important group that people are interested in at that time was SU2. So, uh, so that's why it's called non abelian gauge theory. Okay. So the excellent principle that Yang and Mills use are very natural, namely it's the L2 norm of the curvature of the connection. So the L2 norm of the curvature of the connection gives rise to a excellent for the theory or young males uh, on non abelian gauge group. So this young males theory was beautiful, but at that point it's only a classical theory. Classical theory is not enough to describe particle physics. Only in 1970, late 19, I think it was in a whole thesis dissertation in 1969, one start to understand how to quantize with this theory. Quantizing of young males is difficult because it's gauge dependent and it's non-commutative. And uh, this was based on preliminary works of Fedev and Popov. And this, uh, they introduced the concept of goals. And this is difficult work as there's a public choice of gauge. The work of Hoff was continued by Redman, who was his advisor, and David Gross and uh, Wilczek and others. And this becomes a major work uh, in the 1970s. It's the foundation for the theory of standard model of modern particle physics. Uh, so if the whole theory was developed in the 19, uh, starting 1969 until 1975 or 76, the theory was more or less complete. And so far, the theory has been important. And they keep on uh, making some small corrections, but everything is still perfect almost. So this is how modern theory of particle was studied. And now the equation of motion defined by young Mills uh, action in a Euclidean setting, so to so speak, is a nice elliptic system. And this unfortunately was not studied by geometers much, although people realized, I think, this kind of equation. But there was not much uh, method to study such a nonlinear system. And uh, so this is uh, rather interesting uh, because there's not even good examples in those days. Uh, just like, um, actually, just like Einstein equation. Uh, before Einstein uh, introduced the Einstein equation, we don't have much examples for the Riemannian geometry. And now, uh, in terms of young males, uh, only during the process of quantization the gauge theory, they start to introduce the concept of monopoles and instantons defined on four dimensional Euclidean space. So two great physicists at Hoff and Polyakov start to find important special solutions in young Mills equation. So this uh, is interesting. You minimizing the young Mills energy in terms of topological data, and then based on the last property, they pay important roles in topological quantum field theory. So the topology of the gauge group of the gauge theory gives you a lower bound of the young Mills energy. And what they do is that they assume the young Mills energy reach the topological lower bound. And this defines something called instanton. And this, or sometimes they call BPS state. And this instanton uh, are beautiful. And this was studied in the case of Euclidean sphere. And this inspired many people, many mathematicians to work on this, this subject after looking up the examples given by them, uh, by Hoff and Puryako. And, and this inspired a whole group of uh, mathematicians to work on this. And uh, so in Stony Book, uh, start by Yang and Simons, and then Singer from MIT, all of them start to look at this instant time. And this developed into the whole theory by Atiyah, uh, Hitchin, and several people much later. Not much later, actually, not, around 1976 or so. Anyway, at the same time, this equation of instanton were rewritten in 1977 by Xian Yang in terms of what he called Coach Liman equation. This is a history that many mathematicians did not realize. And uh, so, in fact, in 1977, I still remember very well Yang showed me this paper. 1977, Yang wrote down the equation in terms of Young Mills equation. Uh, uh, in terms of Koji-Liman equation. So in fact, he 
what he did is that for anti-shirt fuel bundle, uh, bundle with anti-shirt fuel connection, uh, which is an instanton uh, bundle, he could be written in terms of holomorphic bundle over complex projective space, over complex Euclidean space. He, he wrote it down, Euclidean space. And this equation becomes what now, nowadays I call it Hermitian Young Mills connection. So the equation was written in a, in a holomorphic way, and this interpretation has been very, very important. It sets it a certain equation on a holomorphic bundle, which we create later called Hermitian Young Mills connection. So this was actually done by Yang, CN Yang, in 1977. Uh, probably he did it before that, but published result was in, in the physics letter in 1977. And uh, so in this form, the hermitian young mills connection or the anti shelf due connection can be generalized to higher dimensional. In the original form, it cannot be generalized. anti shelf due connection in high dimensional uh, manifold, Riemannian manifold, is not uh, generalizable uh, in a natural manner. But after Yang's work, you can look at it as a whole more bundle and you know what that is. So this can be generalized to high dimensional Kähler manifold in a natural manner. So this equation was really due to Yang himself, and many mathematicians did not seem to know yet. <clears throat> now, this, pay in, this turns out to be supersymmetric in nature, once you write it down in this form. And <clears throat> the important case was in complex three dimensions, where the bundle would be defined in a Calabial manifold, which um, people uh, pay much attention after string theory was uh, developed. And this become play, they play important roles in the development of string theory and algebraic geometry, which I will describe a little bit later. So, uh, in the case of algebraic surface, uh, was due to Simon Donaldson and high dimension due to Ken Wimber and myself. Now, in fact, this is an interesting development because uh, uh, these are very much related to the Karabi conjecture, when I did, which I did in 1976. Uh, because um, there's, a release, there's an analog between these two, the bundle theory and the metric theory. And so we draw a lot of uh, uh, attention from the bundle field, uh, from the metric theory. And this is important. And, uh, and uh, so I will come back to that a little bit later. Now, in the meanwhile, Donaldson observed that a modular space or instanton can be used to define topological, topological invariance for the four manifold, four dimensional manifold, where he made the first major achievement in the theory of topology of smooth four manifold. It's well known. And <clears throat> this, of course, uh, people ignore the foundation work due to Ken Ruinbert and Cliff Taubes. Ken Ruinbert has understood the modular space in a much more detailed way than any other people, because at here Singer, uh, uh, Hitchin, they only study in the case of a, a sphere or CP2, and where standard manifold, but Ken Wimberg was able to study this thing for general form manifold, and which is needed by Simon Donaldson in this theory. So without the foundation work, Donaldson would have to wait for much longer time. Anyway, the Donald's invariant has been fundamental, but it's not so easy to compute. Until 10 years later, Cyber and Witten found a similar invariant for four manifold, which I described earlier using uh, the Cyber Witten equation developed earlier. And this basically recaptured almost everything that Donald's invariant could do, and in a much simpler way. Um, and Taos actually made a fundamental contribution to the subject of sympathetic geometry by constructing pseudo holomorphic curves based on the non vanishing or cyber written invariance. Uh, so cyber written invariance, which was motivated by physics, has played a very important role in constructing topological invariance or sympathetic invariance based on holomorphic curves. And this many major results, as a result, was solved by this work of Kriptos. In particular, the uh, important question of whether complex projective space admits a unique sympathetic structure or not was only solved by Taos in, in the case of CP2. And this was the only method that I know of. The reason he can do it is because he can produce non-trivial pseudo-holomorphic sphere 
based on topology of CP2. So this, this part was very analog to the Frankel conjecture that I did with Seal, and which uh, Tom sees the analog, and he produced such holomorphic curve. This was generalized to more uh, general uh, synthetic four manifold uh, besides, uh, besides uh, uh, CP2. Uh, the other important development was due to Karabi, where he was uh, interested in Young Mills' action on the space of metrics. Uh, so Karabi was never interested in physics. He emphasized many times. He just looked at this whole thing as an interesting development. And uh, so already at the same time when Young Mills wrote down their equation, Karabi already saw the same thing. In the space of Kähler metric, with the same Kähler class, he looked at the young mills action, exactly the same action, and then he looked at the critical point of them, and he gave rise to our Kähler anti metric. If the Kähler class is proposed in the first chain class. So that's what Krabi did. The concept of Kähler anti metric actually went back to Kähler. <laughs> in 1931, Kähler wrote down the Kähler anti metric, the equation of Kähler anti metric. <laughs> He in, he, in fact, was urged uh, people, the readers, to study the existence of Kähler anti metric in 1931. So, the very first paper of Kähler uh, uh, metaphor. But anyway, so uh, Krabi looked at this one in terms of Young Mills functional already. The existence of such critical points was not known in a special case, it's called the first, uh, it's called the Krabi conjecture when the first chain class is equal to zero. Because in that case, uh, the, the critical point, which actually is a fourth order equation, now can be reduced to second order equation, second order Mong pair equation. So this is a very important reduction. Uh, so, uh, so now you see, after this discovery, we know the concept in Kähler geometry, in complex geometry, and also, as I said, in the, in the gauge theory generalization. But now, there's this work of Kulisa, uh and followed by, he's he a mathematician, and then the physicists follow him, cry. So they make a spectacular approach uh, to create a Maxwell equation from a vacuum Einstein equation. So that was done right after Einstein developed the theory of Einstein equation. And up to now, I'm still amazed by this statement. Uh, you do a Einstein equation in five dimensional uh, space time. You take a circle above the uh, uh, four dimensional space time, and you apply action principle where the matter is trivial, no matter at all, on nine dimensional, five dimensional uh, manifold. And then you create a equation in four dimensional uh, manifold, and then you find out. Uh, you effectively you found Lorentz and metric tensor on a four manifold with a vector field and a scalar on a four manifold. So you do a circle reduction. So there's a circle action on this five dimensional manifold. You reduce the five dimensional metric tensor down to a four dimensional manifold, and you get a uh, three, three things a metric on the four manifold and a vector field on the four manifold and the scalar field on the four manifold. The vector field turns out to satisfy the Maxwell equation, which coupled with the metric tensor downstairs. So this recapture, this is a really beautiful theory which tells you you can create Maxwell equation from nothing, from no from an equation no matter. So gravity in high dimension, one dimension higher, create matter in four dimensions. This was really fascinating, and Einstein really liked it. But unfortunately, it created more than what you want. It created one scalar field on the four manifold. The scale, scalar field has never been found in nature. So therefore, this part is so beautiful, it was given up. Uh, but it was never really given up. The idea has been there all these years, in the last hundred years. But uh, the fact that uh, you can create um, Electricity and magnetism out vacuum is fascinating. And the way that you create it is by dimension reason, by one dimension higher. 
So this really a mysterious and beautiful uh, structure that was used. Now, <coughs> this theory is the forerunner of the competitive theory, modern string theory. About 35 years ago, uh, when string theory was uh, proposed, the proposed model is to replace the circle that used by Kulisikai by six-dimensional manifold satisfy certain constraints. So string theory uh, demands that the space-time should be 10 dimensional based on conformal anomaly uh, and it automatic it has make the assumption that space-time has to be supersymmetric. So the supersymmetry gives rise to a constraint on the six dimensional manifold and the six dimensional manifold has to be Kla. Uh, under that that reduction. So if I, I write a 10 dimensional manifold to be a product of four dimensional manifold with a six dimensional manifold, the four dimensional manifold we assume is Minkowski space time. The six dimensional manifold should satisfy the supersymmetry assumption and that gives rise to Krabiel manifold because there are two important invariants. One is the Kala metric itself the Kähler metric is covariant constant, and then there's another holomorphic volume form which is also covariant constant. So there are two covariant constant uh, uh, structure over there that give rise to something called n equal two supersymmetry, and this characterizes the concept of Krabian manifold. Holonormal group is SU free. In order for the holonormal group to be SU free, it has to be Krabian manifold where uh, there exists a Kähler metric with vanishing rigid curvature and a pair of holomorphic free form. So that was how uh, it was developed in 1984. When, uh, <coughs> so this was due to Kederas, Horowitz, Strominger, and Witten. Uh, <coughs> but the metric, of course, um, uh, was proof. And uh, at that point, it was a very non-trivial work. And, uh, <coughs> This uh, um, manifold, actually, when I, uh, when I study it, when I construct it, I propose to several physicists. <laughs> I propose to three of them, actually, uh, before string theory caught on. And actually, Horace was my postdoc, actually, my assistant in Institute of Work 1 study. Schrominger was a postdoc. And Witten was, of course, a professor already in Princeton. And I have Propose to them to use this manifold for study in physics. Uh, they, they said, no, that's not possible. This was in 1981 when I was talking to them. But a few years later, they were very excited about this proposal. So they found out it's very important to know that such a manifold exists. Otherwise, the model does not, uh, is not there. So they need that. And this turns out to be uh, very important, the topology of this manifold. Because many basic physical quantities in nature, including number generation of fermions and grand unification scale and Yukawa coupling, is po can be compelled potentially by the topology of the Karabian manifold. For example, the Euler number of the Karabian manifold is two times the number of generation. We know the number of generation of fermions observed in nature so far is equal to three. So it was <coughs> important to look at Krabian manifolds whose oil number is equal to plus or minus six. And well, at the point when it was uh, proposed, uh, people thought there were only a three copies of Krabian manifold. One is a quintic, one is a uh, what they call C manifold, and uh, I forgot the other one. But anyway, they, they, they thought there were only three. And this was extremely exciting for them. Because if there are only three copies of Krabian manifold, then one would like to calculate everything from, of nature from this manifold completely. And this turns out to be not true uh, because uh, there are uh, many more Krabian manifolds. Uh, so um, there are probably uh, a, a uh, at the point when I proposed them, there was about 10,000, I believe. But now it's probably uh, more than that. But it's never clear. Uh, whether we have overcount or undercount, because we have to prove that 
the manifolds are, are diffeomorphic. It's not so clear. Anyway, there are many more than what they what what we know. But in the case uh, of uh, um, number generation, if you insist the number generation is equal to three, then there's actually very few Calabrian manifold with all number equal to plus or minus six. But in any case, once the physicist is quite interested in this manifold in 1984, huge amount of work was put into this uh, study of this manifold based on algebraic and enumerative geometry. Uh, this come without um, uh, which I think it's impossible to understand that much because a lot of intuition comes from string theory. Without that, I think we are still uh, we're behind on understanding such manifold. The very major uh, property that arises in physics is the duality between those manifolds. And this was uh, unthinkable at the beginning. I still remember Brian Green and Pesa was in Harvard when I arrived in Harvard three years later. They come to talk with me. He was my postdoc, Brian Green. He found uh, there's some association between manifold, Calabria uh, manifold with oil number equal to a positive oil number to negative oil number the duality between them, and I was very puzzled at that time, uh, because uh, effectively we knew there are more examples of negative oil number than positive oil number, and they came as a duality. But uh, the reason I, I, I found that is because I, I was trying to do things by hand, calculation by hand. But the physicists are much more powerful, they use computer. They do all kinds of extensive calculation. And the computer shows that they're more even. Uh, positive and negative are, are, are symmetric. But anyway, there's much more than that, uh, than just all number uh, uh, due to each other. There are much deeper way to understand them. And this was developed by uh, the physicists and the mathematicians together. And so despite uh, the, some of these are not clear from the point of view of physics, but for mathematics, it's certainly clear. Because all this development later can be proved rigorously uh, within the framework of mathematics judgment. It's not just uh, physics. So the physics actually uh, can uh, inspire you how to go forward to find statements that you want to prove. But the proof of the statement can be done by mathematics. And this, in a way, has become a way to justify uh, uh, string theory because uh, they give very, very, very um, important uh, 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 prediction, a very precise prediction, and we can prove it. So this is a very important uh, uh, justification of string theory because uh, the kind of uh, prediction that they make was not even known to mathematics. And some of them was a uh, some unknown problem for a long, long time. So anyway, so um, this was a uh, important uh, concept um, that has inspired geometry. But let's go into the other direction of uh, uh, of geometry interaction between geometry and physics. This was uh, the theory of uh, more classical theory of mathematics. Uh, in fact. Hilbert, in his uh, way to understand integral equation, he introduced Hilbert space. And then he was trying to understand several drawn operators on Hilbert space. And he looked at the spectrum of this uh, uh, Hilbert space, of this operator. He, uh, it took him, by great surprise, what he called spectrum turns out to be actual spectrum that was found in nature. Uh, it's quite a coincidence. Uh, he called it spectrum but it was found in nature. So, so, uh, so Hubert was very much amused by this. And then Heaven White found the fundamental Y law for the asymptotic behavior of the spectrum of linear elliptic, uh, elliptic operator based on the question on black body radiation. Black, black body radiation. This was a question raised by Lorentz uh, before Hubert. And when Hubert gave a lecture on it, and uh, he thought that he would never see a proof of such a statement in his lifetime. But his student, Herman Wein, was able to prove it in a short time afterward. And this theory uh, developed by Herman Wein 
relating soon becomes a fundamental part of uh, mathematics or geometry, relating index of the operator to the topology of manifold. Uh, many of the ideas really dates back to Hermann and uh, and this was a important contribution to modern geometry and particle physics. Uh, that give, give rise to the famous Atiyah-Singer index formula, which we have been using uh, extensively in the last 30 years. Uh, so the index formula has been used to study anomaly in quantum field theory in the 1970s and 1980s. And uh, this anomaly has been very important in quantization of gravity give you a concern of what kind of uh, groups and what kind of uh, geometry you should expect. So in Green and Swartz uh, was able to derive the correct grand unification group for the heterotic string setting off the first string freely, Levelson, in 1984. So that was a very important major uh, development in uh, string theory. And, uh, but all this theory uh, was um, uh, has their background, and uh, many of these uh, actually already went back to uh, Hodge and even Abo. If you look at the work of uh, Hodge, and um, there's a period of indigo where studied extensively by Lehman, Abo, Lacan, Jacobi, and others. And, uh, and this kind of uh, amazing at the beginning when string theory was developed, you don't believe this kind of thing could be important, and now, yes. Uh, developed to a point that meant much of this old classical theory all come into string theory in an extensive manner. And uh, in fact, uh, um, <coughs> Herman White, first of all, uh, formulated the uh, uh, Riemann result in, in modern terms concerning the existence of polarized hot structure. And when she published his uh, first book in 1913, she already uh, has uh, uh, develop a simple form of hot theory on Riemann surfaces based on free dynamics. And this, for, for this philosopher, philosophy was already influenced by the book of Klein, Felix Klein, on Riemann's theory of algebraic functions and the integrals. The, the study of Peter integrals already appeared in Herman Weiss' book in, uh, in uh, two dimensional Riemann surfaces. And of course, uh, uh, this uh, period is just an indigo of a closed form, a Durham form over a cycle. And this gives rise a pairing between topological size, cycles, and space of closed forms, modular, those which are exact. So Hodge proposed forms that are closed and co closed to be harmonic forms. He proved that the period can be realized by harmonic forms. So that was a very important uh, discovery by Hodge. And this actually, as I said, was actually. Uh, done by, Q, uh, by Herman Y in the case of Riemann surface in 1913, uh, about 20 years before Hodge. Uh, but on the other hand, the question of the period, which is this problem, which is Hodge theory, pairing between topological cycles and space of closed forms, already done by Delam, but Hodge wants to restrict the forms with closed and co-closed, so so-called harmonic forms. And, but the theory was already studied in the case of holomorphic forms, and, in, in, uh, and this was developed in the 19th century, about yet. And uh, so, Herman White established the theory of harmonic forms on Riemann surface based on the Dirichlet principle of Riemann, already in 1913, as I said. And Hodge then generalized it to high dimension based on the theory of parametrics of Hadamard. Now, actually, Hodge, when he generalized it uh, using these parametrics, he made a mistake on his proof. And the proof does not, uh, it was not complete, although in principle we know it's true, but it needs to be justified. And this was justified by Herman Weiss himself, actually. Um, so, uh, the, the Hot theory was to use to understand dependent forms and the, and the lapses result in the topology of algebraic variety. So Hodge was majorly interested in topology of algebraic variety, trying to understand the topological result due to lapses, and this was really important. 
And then he studied this film, uh, this uh, film of the alarm using harmonic integrals. This led to the Hodge decomposition film. But in fact, uh, the Hodge decomposition film actually went back to heaven wide. In 1941, uh, he published a paper called Method of Borgonal Projection in Potential Field. Uh, this theory is basically the method that we now use to prove Hodge theory, to project it to harmonic forms, to closed forms, and co closed forms. And this method he used successfully in Lehman surface, and this was later used extensively to study Hodge theory, the Hodge decomposition theorem. And uh, so uh, then after uh, Hodge, I mean, after Hodge and Herman Y, Koraira in Japan was able to develop the whole theory, even with the case of boundary. So, um, so he also gave, uh, collect the problem of, uh, um, of Hodge, and he, put, he later generalized the existing harmonic forms with piecewise singularity and periods. So he generalized a Hodge theory to more general situations. By early 50s, Milgram and Rosenberg introduced a heat equation method to give a proof of the Hodge theory. This was a very important development that many people did not give uh, credit to. This is the first time where heat equation method was used extensively in geometry. And this heat flow has tremendous influence in the later development in geometry. The first uh, important uh, development was the, was the, the work of uh, use and sample on the harmonic maps, and later to the rigid flow of Hamilton, the work of uh, Milgram and Rosenberg. Uh, from the early 50s all the way to now, the development of Hodge theory. Now, um, so the estimate, the Herman Y estimate, and all these asymptotic estimates has actually went back all the way to 19th century. And by the study of heat kernel and Tobelian film uh, was developed by Herman Weyer and later by Hovanda and many, many people using semi-classical approach uh, based on uh, heat equation and also based on the wave equation. All this has been important development. And this has been important uh, not only in, uh, in geometry but also in graph theory and, and, the, and also relating the length of closed geodesic of the manifold to uh, the eigenvalues and give many beautiful results and including the local index theorem of Atiyah Singer. So uh, this theory has been also playing an important role in modern quantum field theory. So, um, well, um, as I said, the topology of uh, four manifold was uh, um, important in the, in in the class of uh, uh, instanton uh, physics, and um, but then in the other direction into general relativity itself, it's interesting. General relativity was developed uh, as as actually as one of the pioneering development of understanding geometry, but the development of General relativity itself is actually much slower. The reason is that Lorentzian geometry is much more complicated and non-intuitive compared with uh, with uh, Riemannian geometry, Euclidean geometry, uh, positive definite metric. And so, in the 1960s, there were development by Roger Penrose and Hawking about black hole uh, existence. Uh, that was a very important work. But then there was a very uh, important question that was raised by Einstein himself. is the question of positive mass theorem. The reason why mass has to be positive is that if in a physical theory mass is negative, the whole theory would be unstable. If it's unstable, the theory does not make sense. Every physics has to be reasonably stable, cannot be unstable. So if it's negative, the whole thing collapses in a matter of seconds. So, so it cannot uh, be true. So any sensible theory has to be positive mass. And this was a big question. And some very simple special case was developed. And uh, in fact, uh, 
the major conference in general activity always uh, put in some time to understand uh, this problem for a long, long time. This was finally settled by Richard and myself in 1978. And this has rather uh, important consequence besides the proving the famous problem in general relativity. It also has a uh, good, un good understanding of geometry of manifold reported scalar curvature. So we use minimal surface approach to, to settle this problem. But as, and about three years later, we turned using deluxe spinner to give a different and powerful venue to understand uh, classical general relativity. So the approach based on uh, minimal surface and the approach based on spinner are both important. And it, we used to um, combine them together to give uh, powerful methods in understanding general relativity nowadays. So in the last 30 years, these two methods are complementary to each other and has given powerful uh, results. Uh, so this is a very uh, interesting development because only after that, the theory of uh, portal scalar curvature was uh, uh, becoming uh, uh, much more mature. And this, of course, already went back to the work of Rich Norris uh, in the famous Venetian theorem due to him, which was patterned after the work of Kodaira on the Kodaira Venetian theorem. And of course, also at that time, there was the great work of a tier single in that theorem. They give a lot of interesting obstructions that we can deal with. Uh, so at, there are many developments by geometry and physics. Another major development, of course, was the critical point theory, Morse theory, due to Witten. And of course, Morse theory has appeared already 100 years ago. Uh, but to make it to a more analytical and more related to geometry uh, and physics, uh, it was written as well in supersymmetric quantum field theory. And, and this was uh, developed in 1984. And uh, actually, uh, I accept it for general dependent geometry uh, as the chief editor. At that point, all the left fieldists want to reject this paper. <laughs> and I, I felt, uh, I read it. The paper myself, I decided it's sound. Uh, it can be proved. So I accept the paper. But this paper has deep influence in both physics and geometry, actually. Many of the supersymmetric quantum field theory are based on this theory, and so are dependent geometry, including the work of floor on the floor cohomology and synthetic geometry. And all these are very important work that are inspired by this work of written on Morse theory. And of course, there is better Morse himself. And the basic thing is that um, the idea of keeping track of the change of theory when parameter is moving is a very important one. And that's what Witten was able to use. And this becomes a very important fundamental idea to relate, uh, to understand and produce topological invariance. And so this is similar uh, the philosophy was that that by uh, Seibert and Witten based on similar phenomena to connect the Donald's invariant on four manifold to some topological invariant which are easier to compute. So one is much more nonlinear theory due to Donaldson, and the last one is much uh, linear, uh, although not 100% linear. So these are very important development in uh, Morse theory and uh, related to Morse theory. So as I said before, cyber written invariant has opened up a new horizon for four manifold. Uh, uh, freely, and also to study synthetic structures and all that. So, um, well, synthetic geometry was uh, developed in many ways, uh, starting from Eminot as well, and later developed by many people, including Arno, including Atia Board, and all this. And this has become a very important development, uh, as deep influence on, uh, on the understanding of four manifold and complex algebraic surfaces. But actually, um, it's uh, uh, been more uh, than that. Namely, in the synthetic geometry has become much more developed in the last 30 years after it was realized that in the theory of middle symmetry, which was motivated by the physical consideration of Calabrian manifold, it called for a systematic symmetric treatment of synthetic geometry 
with compact geometry. So mirror symmetry calls for a simple duality. That sympathetic geometry should be due to complex structure, Kähler structure. Uh, so the sympathetic geometry of one Calabrian manifold is supposed to be isomorphic to the complex geometry of the Miller Calabrian manifold. Now this is a very important principle that is uh, start from physics, uh, uh, superstring physics, and the point is that there's a something called quantum correction to a sympathetic theory, and the quantum uh, correction contains many interesting geometric objects that we want to study. For example, pseudo holomorphic curves appear in a natural manner, and sometimes they call it uh, glomovitan invariant, and this give rise an isomorphism, which is uh, just based on geometric intuition is not clear at all. But from supersymmetric point of view, this was natural, and uh, this becomes a fundamental uh, philosophy uh, for the development of sympathetic geometry in the last 30 years. And this has been very fruitful. Uh, and this uh, quantum correction, uh, incident correction, uh, has been a very important work that has convinced uh, algebraic geometer this there's something to this whole theory. Let me, Kanderas and other found a closed formula for counting of rational curves within the Calabria uh, five uh, quintex, uh, revealing deep geometric properties of such a theory, which was uh, difficult to find. Uh, in fact, uh, in many ways, uh, just depending on enumerative geometry alone, which has been uh, more than 100 years, there's no way that they would be able to find such a formula. And up to now, there's the only motivation to find this formula still comes from physics. <coughs> Although we can prove it independent of physics. But <coughs> we have to know the formula before we can prove it. So, this was proved rigorously uh, by several people, and this can be considered as a, a fundamental, uh, one of the fundamental way to, to prove that string theory can be justified in mathematics. And uh, this was uh, developed extensively, not just for the quintet, and developed by many, many people. And uh, uh, actually, in Japan, Hosono was my postdoc. We have been putting a lot of work to develop this theory, and this turns out to be uh, quite good. And uh, now, in the last uh, uh, five years, we see some of the development into condensed matter physics, topological quantum field theory, and all that, which I won't go into. Uh, here, and uh, there are some development by uh, several mathematicians in uh, Boston area that we're still working on it. So, uh, so I would say a very important goal in fundamental physics and geometry in the 21st century is to build a solid foundation for theory that's capable to incorporate quantum theory in the small scale of the space time. Insight from physics and geometry to play a fundamental role. And, um, so far, many important uh, theory has been brought in, but it's still far away from being complete. And uh, even uh, some simple concepts probably takes a lot of wealth of geometry and, uh, and physicists to work together. In this afternoon, I will talk about a concept called quasi-local mass in more detail. All these are taking non-trivial mathematical uh, ideas to do it. So I think uh, I'll stop here today.